Good morning, good afternoon. I am really glad to be here with you all today. Um, it's unfortunate I couldn't be there in person. The WHO Regional Advisor for Mental Health and Substance Abuse. So my presentation today is not going to be very long. It will cover the context of the African region. I will talk a little bit about the burden of mental, neurologic, and substance use disorders. And it's COVID, monkeypox, all these other conditions that occur in our region. And then why do we have to rethink mental health in the African region? And finally, uh, the WHO response. So the context of Africa, first of all, the African region is the youngest continent of, in the world. Up to 60% of the population is below 25 years of age. So we have a very young population. And not only that, but the human and social capital of this population is very poor. We have one of the two of the biggest slum areas, low income urban housing, also known as slum areas, globally two out of five. That is Kailicha in Cape Town, South Africa, and Kibera in Nairobi. We have others that are growing. They are, they are parts of the African continent predicted to grow very fast, these low, um, low income, urban, urban uh, unplanned uh, developments. We also have conflicts and poverty, a lot of poverty in the African region. Most of the low and uh, lower middle income countries are in the, most of the countries are low, lower middle income, but we also have conflicts and I will talk a little bit more about that. Now, the burden of disease for sub-Saharan Africa, um, this one looks at the burden by cause, and we can see that neonatal conditions are high. We have almost a triple burden of disease. We have neonatal conditions. We have maternal death also being quite common, but we also have NCDs and mental health conditions being quite high up. And if we look at mental and neurological conditions, we, they are six. If we add um, substance use disorders, we, they go even higher than that. 85% uh, of the epilepsy burden globally is in the low and middle income countries, most of it in sub-Saharan Africa. So we have quite a mixed bag of, of conditions in the Africa region. If I'm to talk a little bit more about suicide, suicide, um, we have one of the highest, we have the highest suicide rate globally, not just one of the highest. On the right hand side here, you can see the Africa region has the highest uh, rate at 11.2 for age standardized for both sexes. If we look at for males, again, the Africa region has the highest rates at 18. And then if we look at females, we have the second highest rate. But if we look at individual countries, actually, um, Lesotho has the highest rate for females globally. So um, we do have a very high burden. And this is a bit of a conflict, and I will talk about it when we come to rethinking mental health in the Africa region, because when we look at the league table of cause of death for, for the Africa region, suicide does not even feature there in the top 10. So this causes a bit of a dilemma for governments when it comes to planning. What is it they should be focusing on? Should they be focusing on, on suicide? where we are the highest globally, but when they look at their own individual league tables or even at the regional level, if we are looking at league tables, suicide does not feature there. Um, these are the top 10 countries for suicide. And as you can see, uh, six of them are African countries. So it is a big problem 
it is a big problem in the region and definitely we should be doing something more. The next area I will talk briefly about is that of alcohol use and heavy episodic drinking. So this is an, again another dilemma area where alcohol use in the African region has been going down uh, consistently, but very, very slowly. So the African region is one of the regions where the use of alcohol is not going down as fast as in other parts of the world. For instance, in the European region, it's going down uh, much more significantly. The challenge that we also have for the African region is that while we have adults not consuming a lot of alcohol. So a big population of abstainers in, in the adult population. But we do have young people from 13 years, from 15 years, as this one shows, who are using alcohol and not only using alcohol, but who have harmful patterns of the use of alcohol. And that is another challenge that we have. So on the one hand, uh, it may seem like we don't have a very big problem when it comes to alcohol use compared to other parts of the world, but we have such a big population of young people who use alcohol, including this table among drinkers. So this previous one looks at uh, heavy episodic drinkers just in 15 to 19 year olds for all population, the whole population. So average doubt among drinkers and non-drinkers. But if we look at drinkers, you can see here five countries where males are almost up to 100%, definitely over 90% of drinkers in those countries uh, being heavy episodic drinking, drinkers, which is a, a very harmful pattern of drinking. And this continues on, you know, um, to over 60%. So if you have over 60%, it means at least two out of three drinkers in this age group are heavy episodic drinkers. Very worrying when we think about um, the, the alcohol attributable burden of disease, not just today, but in the years to come. So the effects of this drinking in the young people is not seen today, but it's seen in the, young, in the, in the, in the years to come and um, also impacting on the trajectory of the lives of these young people who start to drink and who start with harmful patterns of drinking at such an early age. Um, this one just shows some the numbers of people 13 to 15 years old who are drinking, very worrying. We should have nobody drinking alcohol at 13 years old. So having even 3% for me is worrying, but we have countries where we have up to 42% of the population consuming alcohol, young people 13 to 15 years of age. Uh, the next area I will talk about is that of um, neurological disorders, because when we say mental disorders in the African region, it actually covers mental, neurologic, and substance use disorders. So I touched a very little bit on the mental disorders, talking about suicide, which is one of the SDG indicators. Uh, I talked a little bit on alcohol, and now I'm going to talk a little bit on neurologic disorders. And um, this one shows the top five neurologic disorders by DALIS disability adjusted life years for the region. And um, the top one is stroke, the second is meningitis, the third is migraine and headache, the fourth is epilepsy, and the fifth is Alzheimer's. So it's always very surprising when we talk about Alzheimer's and other dementias in the African region, because again, that is another condition that we are not quite yet paying attention to. But not only that, but we also have stroke that is number one globally and number one in the African region. But I can tell you that um, there has been a lens shown on stroke meningitis. Definitely we have a new strategic plan coming out and so definitely something is being done in that area. 
if I continue to talk a little bit more on the neurological on the neurological disorders, you will see that West Africa has the highest burden, mainly because of meningitis. So we have a meningitis belt running across West Africa, and that raises the burden there. But we do have quite a bit of stroke, uh, both east and west, whereas south central, uh, the burden is quite low. So it's important to look at that. Um, Epilepsy, while appearing not to be such a high burden disorder here, the African region actually has uh, one of the highest rates of epilepsy globally and also has the highest number of people up to, I believe it's about 75% of people who have epilepsy who do not have access to care. And we know that even with simple medications, uh, epilepsy can be controlled. And yet we have up to 75% of people living with epilepsy and not yet getting access to care. So that is a big problem as well. If we look at um, moving away from the conditions now and looking at what is the government response, what are they doing about it? Um, this data is from the Mental Health Atlas of 2020. And the first area we shall look at is that of expenditure. You can see 2014, we didn't have data on expenditure, but when we, when we looked into it in 2017, the African region was investing about 10 cents, 10 cents. <laughs> you can imagine, 10 US cents per capita. This has increased to 46 US cents in 2020. So in the last one, it's 46 US cents per capita. And uh, we wonder then how much can one do with 46 US cents? This is the government expenditure in mental health. How much can one do with that amount? Mm, it's a big challenge. So the global distribution of mental health expenditure, um, here on the left-hand side, you can see the low-income countries and the trends over the years compared to um, the high income on the right-hand side. But where is this funding going to? And on the right-hand side, you can see that most of it actually goes to the big institutions and very little is going to the community care. So we have a big challenge uh, again. Very little investment is being put into mental health and this very little investment, almost 100% of it is going into large institutions in the big cities, which end up being underfunded. Um, if we had to think about it. The mental health workforce, the mental health workforce, you can see once again, Africa has a very low mental health workforce, about one point, um, we have about 1.6 of a person. So one person and a bit more, uh, 100,000 of the population. And um, it may not sound too bad, but you can see how we compare to other regions of the world. But we also look at this one person, what is the quality of the one person, the expertise, and the majority of the people actually uh, psychiatric nurses. So the specialists, the psychiatrists, and the clinical psychologists are very, very few. Um, so we have the, the not just the maldistribution, most of them being in the urban centers, but also the expertise. So most of them are psychiatric nurses, but we also know that a lot of them are also nursing aides, so not trained, non-specialists, non-formally trained healthcare workers looking after our people with mental health conditions. Um, just a little bit on the status of emergencies in the African region, and this one came out about a week or so ago, last week, I believe. And um, we have two new events. You can see the number of, of uh, events, as they are called, 151 events in the African region. But the two that are of importance are that we have had these two, Nigeria and Ethiopia, 
um, grade three protracted conflicts, meaning they have gone on for a long time and they are also graded very high. Grade three is one of the highest levels. Um, but otherwise, all countries have been affected by COVID and now we have increasingly more countries affected by Marburg. And that could be the, the two there, Marburg and um, monkeypox also uh, slowly on the rise in the African region. So we have all these floods, cyclones, just um, this past week, we had more floods happening and earthquakes, mudslides happening in Sierra Leone. So um, weather related events on the increase in the region. So how can we rethink mental health then in the African region? What do we do? How do we need to think about it differently? On the one hand, I talked about high suicide rates globally, and yet suicide is not in the league table for the top 10 causes of death in Africa. I talked about the high burden of alcohol use disorders, and we have a conflict in our region with the government looking for income from the alcohol industry. And most of our governments actually not even labeling it as sin tax. So it doesn't go into the healthcare service per se, but goes into the general budget uh, uh, sources of revenue for the government. And so even if they do collect increased revenue from alcohol, it does not directly benefit the healthcare service. We have very low investment in mental health by governments, as I indicated, 46 cents per capita on average, and yet we have a very low tax base. So however much we say governments should be investing more, we also know that the governments may not have any more that they can invest right now. There's a very low tax base. I talked about the human resources for mental health uh, challenges, geographical and uh, as well as expertise, and the inability to pay a living wage resulting from uh, the ve very low tax base. The governments don't have the resources to pay the healthcare workers a living wage. And so we have migration of qualified mental health uh, workers out of our countries and into, and into the higher income countries. So these are some of the challenges we face, but what is WHO Africa region doing to try and respond to um, this, this um, different way of being that Africa is. One is to support member states to develop policies and, strate and strategic plans and, and legislation that are aligned to the context of each of the countries. So this is something that we do as WHO. We have also been developing mental health investment cases um, we did so in Uganda, Kenya, and Zimbabwe. Other countries have gone ahead and done so, like Ghana, like Liberia, with the support of um, other agencies like United for Global Mental Health. In developing the mental health investment cases, we can, we can align where we need to be investing to the context of the country and the resources available and the returns on the resources available in those countries. Um, we have the special initiative for mental health being implemented in Ghana and Zimbabwe. I'm very sorry, this is an error here. Um, in Ghana and Zimbabwe, the special initiative for mental health uh, is being implemented and it will demonstrate the ability to um, strengthen mental health services if um, resources are mobilized and actually invested in a consistent manner. So uh, very soon we shall be able to show results for that. Both countries have developed their implementation frameworks. They have identified uh, provinces or regions where they are going to be implementing and the implementation has started and will be evaluated regularly. We have also looked to integrate mental health into NCDs, NTDs, TB, HIV, AIDS, 
early child development, as well as maternal health, among others. So whatever opportunity we find, we, we try to integrate mental health there because it's not going to be possible for us to strengthen standalone mental health programs with the resources that we have available and the resources that are provided by government. So uh, the good news is that um, the Global Fund, for instance, has put out a new call, the next call is actually has prioritized mental health. If we can show that we can deliver a program that strengthens the outcomes for HIV or TB care, then we will, we will be able to access those resources as well. So there are all these different opportunities that are coming up and that we encourage um, the countries to take and we support countries, countries to take them. And then um, the next one is strengthening of mental health and psychosocial support through different avenues. We have had regional meetings. Um, we are in the process of developing a situation analysis. We are supporting five countries to strengthen programming. They are going to get a little bit of seed funding to, to pilot strengthening of, of uh, mental health programming. We are also rolling out uh, mental health within the such support training being provided to countries through the EPR program, emergency preparedness and response program. So even there we are integrating mental health in that. So um, we are moving more and more to see how to integrate mental health into different programming platforms. And that's the only way that we can strengthen mental health in the continent. Uh, the final one is the um, mental health implementation framework for the African region, which was endorsed by the 72nd Regional Committee this August, August 2022, which we hope will go a long way as well to strengthening countries, um, overwhelmingly supported it, and made commitments to support and increase investment in mental health. Thank you very much.